your Bibles to uh, Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. We're going to look, look at several selections from this, but I just wanted to read from the third chapter to simplify things. Uh, but we're beginning a new sermon series entitled Right with God. Uh, through this study, we're going to take an extended look at how Jesus Christ has come to make us right with God and, and the work of redemption and how that redemption, how that work applies to us in our daily life together. And as we begin, we need to lay some basic groundwork. We need to answer the simple question, why do we need to be made right with God? Now we might assume we know the answer to that question, but don't assume that everyone agrees to the answer. We can't even assume that everybody agrees that the question should be asked in the first place. The world does not recognize the fact that we need to be made right with God. Now, nobody needs to be told that something's wrong with the world. Everyone recognizes that life doesn't work the way it should. Even if we don't know how life is supposed to work, we know that what we experience is not how life is supposed to work. Everyone recognizes that pain and grief are evils. Even if things like death seem a natural part of life, we know in our core that it's wrong. We know in our core that cancer is wrong. We know in our core that divorce is wrong. We know in our core that the death of children is wrong. That's why it hurts us so much. No, we all know that something is wrong with the world. And where we differ is on the cause of what's wrong. What has caused all of the pain, all of the evil, all of the grief that we experience in the world? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Why do people do terrible things to one another? Why are there natural disasters that kill thousands, even millions of people? Why do diseases ravage the earth? And the way that we answer this question reveals something of the heart of our worldview. Because any diag diagnosis determines the medical treatment. Hillary Sam and I have been watching the old uh, television show House. And the entire premise of House is figuring out the diagnosis. And treatment after treatment after treatment doesn't work until the diagnosis is correct. If we believe that the reason we experience pain and grief in the world is because we're overly attached to the physical world and to our belongings, then we're going to say that solution... The solution is to detach from the physical world and embrace spiritual enlightenment. If we believe grief and disappointment come because we have expectations, then we think we can save ourselves grief and disappointment by not having any expectations. If we believe the reason that people do terrible things to one another is because of their ignorance... We believe we can fix the problem through proper education. If we believe the problem with the world is the economy, is the way people view their possessions, maybe it's capitalism, then we simply overturn the economy and we do away with capitalism. If we believe that racism is the cause of society's ills, or another political party, or chauvinism, or toxic masculinity, then those are the things that we're going to try to eradicate and overturn and put something else in its place. Because your diagnosis determines your treatment. And the world's favorite diagnosis for the problem of pain and evil is this. It's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's fault. 
The problem is out there. After all, man is basically good, right? I'm basically a good person. So anything that's wrong with the world has to be from somewhere outside of me and people who are like me. Anything, in fact, could be the problem with the world other than us. The Bible, however, tells a different story. It tells us that because of one man's simple act of disobedience, man is not basically good. Because of one man's simple act of disobedience, the entirety of human life and life in this world is subject to disease, is subject to futility, is subject to destruction, is subject to death is subject to the wrath of God. What I'm describing, of course, is known as the problem of evil. And the problem of evil is one of the atheist's favorite objections to levy against the biblical faith. But friends, this morning I want us to see that as Christians, we don't avoid the problem of evil. In fact, the problem of evil is the very first problem that the Bible sets out to address. The cause of our pain and suffering in this world is found in the Bible I have up here, only three pages into the story. And in Genesis 1 through 3, we see that God did not design us for pain, He designed us for paradise. God did not design us for pain. He designed us for paradise. You see, in the Christian worldview, we actually acknowledge that the problem of evil is a real and legitimate problem because we weren't made for this. That instinct in us that that wants life to go well, expects life to go well, expects for us to finish a project, to clean a room, and it stay clean. The the assumption that we can have happy and loving relationships and I can get a relationship to a point where it can coast and be on neutral and there are never any problems in that relationship again, that impulse is actually true to life as God designed it to be. But it's not true for how life is now. The perfectionist is trying to live in the Garden of Eden. The person who tries to set everything at peace in their life and in their relationships is designed for the Garden of Eden. But that's the life that then was, not the life that is now. And we see this in five key aspects of God's design for man. This this impulse for perfection, for goodness, for wholeness, for peace. First, Adam and Eve were made in God's image. Look at chapter 1, verse 26 with me. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every living, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And I have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold... It was very good. Adam and Eve were made in God's image. And what that basically means is that mankind, both man and woman, 
the male and the female, were created to reflect God's character and His glory in the world. We were designed to be God's image, the representation of who God is in the physical universe. Adam and Eve were made holy and righteous, creative and wise, generous and loving, holy and happy. And they were made for relationship with God. Second, and directly related to the fact that they are created in God's image, Adam and Eve were given a God-like commission to live out on earth. Adam and Eve were designed to be fruitful and multiply. It means to have babies and to spread out on the earth. But not just in a biological way way, not just in a populating the earth way, remember how they were designed. Adam and Eve were designed to be reflection of God's image on earth. And so in being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth, Adam and Eve are filling the earth with God's image and glory. They're filling the earth with God's image and glory with agents who can bring God's kingdom, God's rule, God's love, His grace, His creativity to bear on every square inch of the planet. So Adam and Eve were designed for fruitfulness, for multiplication, for subduing and exercising dominion on the earth. And in this, Adam and Eve were created to be and act like the king and queen of the entire earth. We call Adam the vice regent under God in the original creation. Where God is sovereign king over all, Adam is the steward. He is the one through whom God Almighty exercises his sovereign dominion on the earth. In the original garden, none of God's plans for the earth would have occurred apart from King Adam. King Adam was to be the image and agent of God's rule on the earth. And so just as every square inch of the earth was God's, every square inch of the earth was Adam's and Adam's children forever. Third, in in support of this commission, God gives them abundant provision. We see it in Genesis 1. We also see it in Genesis 2, in in the, the commandment here. God tells Adam, you may surely eat from every tree of the garden except for one. The Hebrew in this this commandment in the garden is is unique. It it has a lot of duplicated words. So it says, eating you may eat. Surely you may eat. In other words, the commandment to Adam, even in the context of the forbidden fruit, is this. Eat to your heart's content. Be filled to your heart's content of every tree of the garden, of every plant, every vegetable, every fruit tree, every berry, every nut, eat to your heart's content. We often say that what God calls us to, He equips us for. And that's exactly what's going on here. The earth itself is producing everything that Adam and Eve need to fulfill their God-given commission. And they're given rest. On the seventh day, the Lord rested. He blessed it and made it holy. 
So six days Adam and Eve were to labor, and on the seventh they were to have communion and rest with God. God was not a slave master, a taskmaster, pushing mankind to produce, to produce, to produce. Rather, it's work, a pattern of work and rest. Work and rest. Fourth, Adam and Eve were given distinct responsibilities as man and woman. See this in chapter 2. When no bush of the field, this is verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, it was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for fruit, food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Now, Adam and Eve were designed by God in his image to reflect his work in the world. But their responsibilities in accomplishing that work and accomplishing that commission differed according to their sex. Adam was given three distinct responsibilities. First, Adam was placed in the garden to work it. The Hebrew word here means to de- develop it, to serve it, to serve in it, to nurture it, to expand its borders. Right? Because we read in Genesis 2 here that the original Garden of Eden was very contained. It was the only place on the earth that actually had green life. And so Adam was to take that seminal garden, that, that place where God's dwelling was with man, and spread its borders throughout the face of the earth. He was to work the garden. He was also to keep it. The Hebrew word means to defend it, to protect it, to maintain it. In other words, even though God made Adam and Eve in a state of innocence, the very commandment and purpose that God put Adam in the garden for presumed that there was evil out there somewhere. There was a threat to the garden somewhere that Adam was responsible to defend the garden against. Otherwise, why would you need to keep or protect the garden? Third, Adam was given the commandment from God concerning the two trees. And implicit in this is the commandment that he was to teach this to Eve, because notice when God gives the commandment about the two trees, Eve is not on the scene. Eve has not been created yet. Now, one of these trees was a tree of life, a tree which, when part of the human diet, would guarantee eternal life. It was, we might call it, the sacrament of that original 
creation covenant. It represented perfect communion with God and the receipt of His blessing forever. The other tree was of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eating of this tree, God said, would would bring sure and certain death. It was not that this tree was poisonous. Rather, it was that disobeying God was poisonous. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented submitting to God's word. We eat of the tree of life and we don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that we have life. We trust that God knows what he's doing when he says don't eat of this tree. We trust that God knows good and evil and we trust his judgment about what's good and evil and we don't take that for ourselves. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not a bad tree. I want you to understand this. Rather, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented living by faith because it trusted God to determine good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the one thing that was a challenge from God to Adam and Eve to trust me that I know best. The tree itself was not evil. It was the eating of it that was evil. Now, because of Adam's responsibilities to work and protect the garden and to teach God's word to others, Adam was responsible to teach this command about the two trees to Eve first, and then when they had children, he would have been responsible to teach that to his children. Now, because of these three, these three responsibilities that come together, the Bible teaches us that, that Adam was really the, the priest king of the Garden of Eden. He was not only king given dominion, he was also priest. Because these commands to serve in God's presence, to protect God's presence, and to teach God's word in God's presence, those are priestly responsibilities in the Old Testament. So Adam was the priest king of the Garden of Eden. Now Eve was given a much simpler responsibility. God created her to be a helper. In other words, Eve is just given this general role. She's given no specific things as as a woman, as Adam's wife, you're to do all these different things. Rather, her role is to come alongside Adam and to help him. To help him do what? To help him do everything that God had given him to do. To be somebody that he could lean on. And in particular, to be an answer to his aloneness. There's only one thing in in Genesis 1 and 2 that God said is not good. And it's that Adam was alone. God didn't create Adam to live by himself or to himself. Rather, God actually created Adam imperfect. Because he created Adam with a relational need. And God did this whole thing of naming the animals to show Adam his relational need. That it was not good for man to be alone. God knew it wasn't good for man to be alone. Adam didn't know it wasn't good for him to be alone. It's only after all the animals are named that he puts two and two together. You know, there are two kinds of each of these animals. they got different equipment. Like, that's how they make babies. Boom, God God puts him to sleep. (laughs) Puts him under divine anesthesia. Now, God created Adam to live in faithful obedience before God and in loving relationship with another human being. We were made for community, for relationship. Not to live with God alone, but with other human beings made in God's image. 
Fifth, Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. That is, in their original state, there was no need for shame. Adam and Eve had nothing to hide from one another, physically, emotionally, spiritually, or personally. Adam and Eve were the only human beings in ever, to ever exist who were able to be absolutely and completely vulnerable with one another all the time. In summary then, we were made to be holy and happy. We were made for communion with God and with one another. We were made for paradise and perfection. We were made for dominion and fruitfulness. We were made for eternal life. We were not made for sin and sorrow. We were not made to be isolated and alone. We were not made for condemnation and corruption. We were not made for slavery or futility. We were not made to die. So what changed? We did. And with us, the entire created order. How did we change? By eating the forbidden fruit. By eating the forbidden fruit. Is that clock right? I've never had to do this before. I think we're going to turn this into two sermons. So now I've got to come up with a conclusion to this one. <laughs> I don't know. God is, though. God's spirit is. Here's, here's what we can take away from this, friends. We live in two worlds. We live in a world that is created by God and very good. We live in a world that is full of beauty. We have, as human beings, incredible potential for good. We can create great works of art and architecture, great works of music and, and movies and, and things. We can do great good to one another. And the Bible teaches us that, that God's image was not destroyed in the fall. Mankind is still capable of great things. We call this the doctrine of common grace. That God did not allow his image to be totally marred and defaced in the fall. Rather, what happened is mankind is distorted. We're like a mirror that's been broken, but not all the pieces have fallen out. So there's still some reflection of God's character and glory in every human being. But because our first parents ate that forbidden fruit, and they reached out and, and took for themselves what was to be entrusted to God, our mirrors are now cracked. They're warped. They're, they're distorted. And so even though mankind is able of, and capable of great good and great beauty, no creature on the face of the earth is capable of as great and evil as we are. James talks about this in his epistle. With one mouth, we're, we give blessing and praise to God, and then we curse our brothers. Who can control the human tongue? It sets the entire world ablaze. That's just our tongue. That's just the way that we speak to one another let alone thinking about our ability to make toxins, to take, say something that was a relatively innocuous virus that was among bats, and we can turn it into something that kills millions of people. We can create something that, that can, is the cleanest source of power and energy and is sustainable for all mankind, for years to come, and we can use it to wipe entire cities off the map in nuclear energy. We are what's wrong with the world. 
but we are also at the same time best thing in the world. And as Christians, as we walk, we need to recognize we have these two elements in us. We are both capable of incredible good, and we're capable of incredible evil. We are what's wrong with the world. But we're also what's right with the world. And God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.